Hey, it's Rod Yates here. Thanks for joining me on another episode of Humans of Music, a Jackster podcast. Each episode, I talk to a music creator or industry professional about their life and career, the ups and downs of their journey, and the lessons they've learned along the way. And my special guest today is legendary producer Bob Marlette, a man who's been making records quite literally for decades, working with artists like Black Sabbath, Alice Cooper, Shinedown, Rob Halford, Leonard Skinner, and Rob Zombie. Now, you might look at a resume like that and assume that Bob's always been a rock guy. But some of his earliest credits as a session musician include working with artists like Laura Branigan and Tracy Chapman. We talk about the long, winding path Bob's career has taken in this interview, packed with many of his killer stories and anecdotes. Before we started recording, Bob mentioned that he never used to give that many interviews, one reason being that he just had his head down with an intense focus on making record after record. So I started by asking him whether he'd always had that focus from a young age. Very much so. You know, and I've always said that, you know, a great part of success is just being being so, you know, sort of clear and single minded about what it is you do. You know, I come from uh, Nebraska, which is a, you know, a place right in the middle of America. And it's sort of real work ethic kind of thing. It's like, dude, you know, you don't talk about it. You actually do it, you know. And then so that was always my mindset is like, you know. Plus, you got to remember, I just love making music. I mean, how lucky am I? You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like pretty amazing that I get to, you know, th- I, I remember, that, you know, the first time I started getting, you know, pretty big checks and I was like, oh, my God, and they're paying me, too. You know, it's <laughs> like I get to do all this, make all this great music and do all this and then they give me money. You got So you got to love that. When was that? When when did those checks start getting to that point? Well, I, you know, I, I got to be honest, I was fairly, fairly lucky because um, a, a lot of people don't realize I actually moved to Los Angeles with my early band, which was the sort of pre-early version of Quiet Riot. Well, back then it was called, I, well, I don't, we were called Shatterstar or something like that, but it was okay. myself... Uh, Rudy Sarzo, Frankie Benelli, and we'd, so we actually moved to LA together, and we actually put that band together in my parents' basement in Lincoln, Nebraska. That was uh, in what 1974, somewhere around there, 74, 75, and then we uh, so we put the band together and toured the Midwest for you know for what two and a half years or so, and then. You know, one day Rudy and I and Frankie were like, "Yeah, we got to move to L.A. We gotta, we gotta go. We gotta go for it." And yeah. my dad gave us his gold Plymouth station wagon, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> we rented a U-Haul. We packed up all our gear. We packed up everything, and we uh, we got in the the station wagon. We uh, took the U-Haul and drove to L.A. And the rest is history. You know. <laughs> How were you feeling arriving in LA, going there to try and make it? It's funny because everybody talks about like, oh my God, how brave you must have been. No, we were stupid. We were just like, (laughs) hey man, let's like, (laughs) let's go do it. We'll, you know, we'll, so what if we starve a little bit? What's the big deal? So we slept in, we actually slept in the back of the station wagon. Uh, But you know what? It was just epic stories in rock and roll. I mean, because it was like, you know, getting to LA and then starting to meet people and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, there was like a year and a half of really lean living in LA when we were so like, oh my God, you know, we'd go to the store, we'd buy one box of macaroni and cheese, right? And then we'd uh, we'd get some flour and water and we'd make, um, we used to call it crepes, but it was really just tortillas, <laughs> right? <laughs> and we just and and we put a little syrup on it if it was like, oh my god, we got syrup. We're you know, it's like, <laughs> and you go to you know when you when you get somebody nice enough to to take us to the diner for a little food, then we'd like steal all the crackers and all the ketchup things. <laughs> it was yeah, it you know it was so classic rock and roll stuff. It was just you know it was so wonderful, but. My big break sort of happened around uh, 79, uh, late 79, early 80. I started playing piano for Al Stewart, Year of the Cat, 
time past that guy, you know, and at that time he was worldwide huge and number ones and all this stuff. And so all of a sudden I went to sort of starving to like, oh, wow, you know, I can eat. <laughs> yeah. Like, and and the I remember the first, you know, that was the first sort of big record. And, and you know, we had a, a, a chef catering the, you know, this was back in the day when, you know, Record budgets were like, you know, 500000 a million dollars, right? Yeah. And there'd be a chef, and I'm like, oh, my God, so I get to eat, too? <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> so, yeah, so they paid me, they fed me, and I'm like, okay, this, it's all pretty sort of great epic rock and roll stuff, you know? Were you still playing with Rudy and Frankie when Randy Rhodes and Kevin Dubrow? I, I actually joined? ended up playing. I, I played keyboards on their first demos. You know, the first demo stuff, and the and the. I think I actually did something on the first record. You know, the second I started getting in the studio and doing this, it was like all of a sudden I sort of realized how much more I liked being in the studio than I did on stage. Don't get me wrong. Mm. I love playing on stage and, you know, and I was so lucky because I got to be on the big stage. I got to, you know, big tours and playing in front of, you know, just tons and tons of people. And that was great. But my wife always suggested that really what it was more about was I was too much of a control freak that I, you know, right. I couldn't I couldn't sort of stop the show and go, well, wait a second, you know. <laughs> I don't think we nailed that second chorus the way we should have, you know, <laughs> can we, let's take that back and try that again. Uh, you know, yeah. and, and I was the guy that, you know, after the show, I would sit there and obsess over every moment. And the great live people are the ones that the second they get off stage, it's like, yeah, goldfish, you know, every, right. you know, it's like, I got no memory of what just happened, but we're going to go party and have fun. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. So, uh, you know, cause I, I was always the guy that would, you know, write the songs in the band and always, you know, be all that kind of stuff. And, uh, arranging was such, and I love playing all the different instruments and, you know, cause people forget I'm actually, I started out as a keyboard player, you know, right. so for a guy who has as many guitars and basses and, and, I, you know, cause I've actually <laughs> probably now played more guitar and bass, you know, or at least as much guitar and bass than I have keyboards in my career. Well, let, let's talk about even even learning some of that stuff. So you, you mentioned before that you grew up in Nebraska. Yeah. Uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Was there was there a lot of music when you were in your household where you were growing up? Oh, yeah. Because I was so blessed because I was actually adopted and they sort of found me in a orphanage in Omaha, Nebraska, and they picked me out and were like, you know, hey, you you come with us, you know, and I'm like, thumbs up, you know. And they <laughs> How were, old were you? Ju- I, oh, I was a baby. I was, you know, right. um, I was like, I think a year, year and a half, somewhere in that vicinity. But uh, man, my life has been blessed all the way down the line, you know, from the fact that my parents, you know, they found me, they gave me a life beyond belief in terms of just nurturing me and giving me always that sort of feeling of you could literally do anything in your life that you want to do, you know, because my my father was a college professor and my mother was a writer. And so I grew up in this sort of nurturing environment where it was always about, hey, you know what, go and make dreams happen. Because I was about as scholastically challenged as you can get. I did. I never mm-hmm. graduated high school. I just, you know, I was literally that guy that was like, I don't know. It's like, I just want to play music, you know. <laughs> and what was amazing was that in the early 1970s in Lincoln, Nebraska, they had the wherewithal to say, yeah, go follow your dream. Go mm-hmm. make music. Go, You know, because... In, in my household, my mother played a, a little piano and my father was just a music buff. All the time there was, you know, opera and there was Edith Piaf playing, you know, it's like there was always very interesting, wonderful, eclectic music always, you know, blaring throughout the house. And, and when you say that they recognized that they said to you, you know, you can you should follow your dreams. Yeah. When did when did music become your dream? 
for me, I think it's the that moment that happened for quite a few kids. It's like I remember that, you know, watching the Ed Sullivan show, you know, watching the Beatles going, oh, my God, look at the, you know, I because I had always been into playing and, you know, because I was always a kid that would just sort of sit down at the keyboard and plop out some notes and see what happened. And, you know, it's like I've said this in, in interviews before about I played a show in my like my first like band when I was like, I think I was 12 or 13 and mm-hmm. I played a battle of the bands at Pershing Auditorium in Lincoln, Nebraska. And it was like <laughs> that first time, you know, and there was probably, you know, 2,500 people there. And if the feeling this, the heat of the spotlight being there, I'm like, I have arrived. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And that was, you know, that was probably the moment that was like, yeah, this is, this is where I belong, you know, because I've always been that guy that, you know, I've always felt more comfortable either on stage or in the studio, you know, life sometimes is, you know, uh, you know, but when I get, uh, when I get there in, in a controlled environment, that's my universe. I'm like, yeah, thumbs up. This is my world. Yeah. So, How old were you when you were told that you were adopted? I mean, and, and did that play any role in shaping you? It's funny because actually, you know, we've just been going through this, uh, this whole thing, uh, because my wife, uh, about 10 years ago, started the search to find my birth parents. And she actually, about two years ago, found my birth mother and birth father and birth relatives, right? And about two years, or like right before COVID hit, we had actually booked flights to go um, they were they were uh, actually lived in Iowa and came to Omaha, Nebraska. My birth mother came to Omaha, Nebraska to uh, the Child Savings Institute. That was the orphanage. She came there. She gave birth to me and um, my parents. And and actually, I went back. I got to meet my birth. Both my birth parents had you know in the last year have died, but I met my birth aunt and sort of birth, a lot of sort of, you know, birth nephew and niece and stuff. And it's been this like, you know, kind of just crazy explosion of, of new stuff. And the, one of the things that, you know, I felt that was absolutely crucial in my life was my parents started telling me I was adopted even before I really understood what it was. Cause there was a, you know, they were always, They didn't want there ever to be this crazy shock of, what do you mean I'm adopted? You know, Mm. they were so unbelievably wonderful that I would just, to me, it was like, I never, I never felt like I needed anything from my birth family because I was Mm. so blessed to, you know, for all of that. So anyway, that's it. That's been a pretty epic, uh, you know, sort of last, uh, couple of years finding this all out, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you're 12 and you play this Battle of the Bands and that's the moment. How then do you end up taking that trek to LA and then ending up on Al Stewart's record? Is it just a gradual stepping process of you working your way through that? You know, for, for a lot of my friends, you know, we sort of, you know, when we still uh, sort of sit down and tell the story of how you know, it's how striking how similar we all are in the sense of, you know, it's like you may have that epiphany moment, but there's a chronological aspect to how it all sort of comes about. So when we moved to L.A., one of the first people that I met in L.A. at the Rainbow was a woman that eventually became my girlfriend Tony Childs. I don't know if you remember who she, yeah, going to walk away. (laughs) Right. So she, she was my girlfriend and we were like, you know what? We should put a band together. The first thing that happens with, you know, all musicians, Hey man, let's put a band together. (laughs) So, (laughs) so it was Rudy, Frankie, myself, um, uh, and, uh, all the guitar player, Pete, uh, Pete Castle, amazing guitar player. He just died a, uh, a couple of years ago, 
but what an amazing guitar player because him and Eddie Van Halen were like neck and neck. But Eddie was so much more driven and much more in, in with, you know, Van Halen, the band and all that. And Pete was sadly, you know, just didn't have the same sort of, you know, thing, right? But mm. man, he, what a guitar player, like seriously amazing guitar player. And that was just right. a, a real sad one. Anyway, so we put the band together with uh, my girlfriend, Tony, and the rest of us. And that lasted for about a year. And then and then when Tony and I broke up, I moved out. And then, uh, and then literally probably a month after I moved out, I got the call to audition for Al Stewart. Because there, there was a period there where I would go to... The Village Recorder, which is a very famous studio back in the day. That's where Fleetwood Mac, Steely Dan, you know, it's like in endless, you know, Super Tramp, endless parade of like some of the biggest records in the world, right? And I got to know a lot of people and, and I started doing a lot of sessions there. And that's where I ended up uh, meeting uh, Artie Barrow and um, uh, Vinnie Caliuta. And so... That's how I ended up working for just a smidge with the Zappa guys, right? That was a right. cool thing because at that time, that was the single most cred gig you could have as a player was working with Zappa, right? So I got all this cred, but it, and that immediately led to getting the audition for Al Stewart and then once I did that and, you know, in, in that environment, that just opened the door to being a session musician. I ended up being, you know, playing on a ton of records as a session player. But I also was writing a lot for other people at the same time. And I was making little home demos, but they actually were sounding pretty good. And bands, you know, and artists were like, hey, man, can you actually do our next record? Because this sounds right. really cool, you know. And the other thing was I, I got a huge leg up from a producer at that time who was really doing really well was a guy named David Kirschenbaum. He was the name producer on Tracy Chapman. He, he had done uh, Joe Jackson, Super Tramp. I sort of became his sort of right-hand man, we would actually co-produce. And he would, you know, he would share the points and the, you know, production credit and everything. And I'm like, how cool is that, right? So- On which records? Actually, it was a bunch. There was um, Laura Branigan. We were mm. supposed to do Wilson Phillips, but we ended up not doing- I ended up working with Wilson Phillips, but after the the first record, because that was- yeah. That was the record that Dave and I were going to do it, but scheduling it didn't didn't happen. But and then there was um, actually the funny one was I was supposed to be there co-producing with him for the Tracy Chapman record, okay. except for I had co-produced with him the Greg Raleigh record. Greg Raleigh was the singer in Santana, singer or uh, Hammond B three player. And in yeah. both Journey and Santana, and and Greg had asked me to come and produce the Santana reunion record. So I I said to David, I said, listen, you know, I'm sorry, but I, you know, as far as we know, it was just a little folk record. This, you know, <laughs> what's the, what's the big deal? So I go up and I start working with the Santana reunion thing, but that was with Neil Sean, Greg Raleigh, Carlos Santana, all you know, all the original guys. And a couple of weeks into the the record, Neil's like, "Hey, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do this other thing, blues for Salvador kind of record." And I'm like, "What? We're we're all here making this record, and all of a sudden you want to go off and do this and." What had happened, though, is David had called me up after the whole sort of thing started falling apart. And he said, hey, man, can you come back and, you know, let's help me finish this up and, you know, play keyboards and whatever. And I was like, absolutely. So this uh, is the first Tracy Chapman album. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So 
I, I come back and I, you know, I end up playing keyboards on it. And the takeaway of that record that I always tell people is that absolutely no one knew that that was going to be what it was going to be. Hmm. And anybody that tells you that they knew that was going to be, they're lying. <laughs> because <laughs> none of us knew. We knew we had something special in the sense that, you know, wow, this is really good and this is really cool. But, you know, the there were a couple of lines that, you know, sort of were the takeaways of that record. The first one was, you know, it's like I'm sitting there, we're listening to a playback of of uh, one of the songs. And, and I say to the engineer, Kevin Smith, I was like, hey, dude, this tops maybe it'll do 10,000 units in the coffee house circuit. Right. But this thing's never going to do anything, right? And I was only off by, what, 25 million plus? <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, it, you know, like I said, I've always, you know, I've always said that people let us know whether we're getting it right or not. Right. Because you know, there's Absolutely. been a few records where I'm like, oh, my God, this is the best thing I've ever worked on in my life. And it's like... Cricket sounds, you know, it's like <laughs> nothing, nothing. So, and then like, you know, like Tracy, it's like, I had no clue. And yeah. the, the uh, one of my other favorite lines was, um, I was sitting on the couch with David and we were listening to the mixes, the playback and the mixes, sort of critical thinking about everything. And his big line was, he leaned over to me and he goes, does it sound finished to you? <laughs> I was like, I looked at him and, and at first I was like, what, what? And, and I realized really in his mind, he was thinking the record label had just given him $250,000 to make this record. Right. right. And it's a guy, I got a fast car. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. And he's like, dude, there's like a little, <laughs> a little bit of this and a boo -doo -doo -doo, you know, and I'm like, plunk, plunk. you know, it, it was just so funny because it was like just no, you know, again, no one knew. And part of the, the technique of recording that record was the fact that you got to remember, Tracy had never been in the studio before. She'd never, you know, couldn't play to click, you know, none of that. So everybody was like, all right, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we let's stick her in the center of the room and we'll s just set up everything around her and let's all just play to her energy. We'll just all sort of say, okay, let's just sort of get into her space and we'll just all make it work to her. You know, that was, you know, that was so cool. And, uh, you know, it's like everything was so exposed. It was all about making sure everything just had its perfect little spot. And that's sure. the beauty of, to me, of, of great record making is when you listen to it, you go, you can't see it any other way than what it is. And right. it's like, you know, somebody in the room saying, you should turn the snare up. It's like, shut up. It's perfect. <laughs> and it's like, eventually you will understand the snare is absolutely perfect exactly where it's at. Because nice. the greatest records... You you know when an audience hears it and they they're not listening to oh man they should have had this done you know it's like no great records you just go wow everything's exactly where it ought to be so absolutely don't fuck with it <laughs> sorry <laughs> after the break Bob talks about working with artists like Alice Cooper and Rob Halford and his adventures with Ozzy Osbourne. Welcome back to Humans of Music and my interview with Bob Marlett. Before the break, Bob was talking about some of his early session work, like playing keys on Tracy Chapman's debut album. Somewhere in the mid-90s, though, he started to get a reputation as a rock producer, working with artists like Black Sabbath, Rob Halford and David Lee Roth. We pick up the conversation talking about his move in that direction. I met a guitar player at a rehearsal hall in the Valley named John Lowry. Okay. John Five. Yes, everybody knows him as John Five, right? I meet this guitar player. Everybody who's not playing 
a pink Jackson guitar <laughs> and everybody who's not completely tattooed on his the whole upper body, take a step back. You, you come with me. And that was the beginning in a lot of ways of the whole rock thing was the fact that here's this kid and I'm like, oh my God. So the first thing that we did together was we created a band. It was John, myself, and a singer named Mark Binder. And the record was called Red Square Black. Mm -hmm. And it was this underground, sort of industrially small, sort of little thing. But it was totally badass because it was really on the front edge of a lot of crazy ass industrial stuff. And it was, you know, I had such a blast because it was, you know, got to remember I'd made all these huge sort of pop rock, you know, and pop and things like that. And this was one of the first times that I was able to just be, wow, whatever came to my brain, I could do because there was no limits, you know. So I was doing, you know, we were doing some crazy ass shit on that record. It was so much fun. It's like John was such a savant that he, you know, anything that I came up with, he could play, you know, and it's like, oh, what if we did this? And he's like, oh, you mean this? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, that's exactly <laughs> it, right? And so we did this thing and nobody ever heard the record because it was so kind of underground, except for Rob Halford, Tony Iommi, you know, all these yeah. guys, right? Heard this record and was like, oh my God, this is so insane. Let's get Bob Marlette, this rock guy. And I'm like, I know, I guess I'm a rock guy now. <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, you know, and I've always, you know, I've always said that one of the, the the keys to success is when the phone rings, you answer it and you say yes. Pretty, pretty simple, you know. And that was it. It's like all of a sudden the phone started ringing, and there was a whole thing that that never got publicized that I'll I'll fill you in on that was pretty cool is that. I got approached by Rob to do a record. This was Rob Halford. Yeah. And Rob had reached out to me. And so we had this meeting and he flew me down to Phoenix. We had this meeting. It was just this sort of whole eye-opening thing for Rob because I was like, hey, listen, dude, you've been in Priest. You've been in Fight. You've taken that about as far as you can go, maybe it's time to open a new door because he is such a good singer mm. and he's so talented. I'm like, what if we made this really cool record that was like, it was not breaking the law, breaking, you know, it wasn't this, you know, it wasn't that or it wasn't this fight, you know, it wasn't this... <laughs> It was like, wow, what if we just reinvented the universe for you? He was like, yes, I want to do this. Let's do that, right? And right after that, he gets a call from Tony Iommi's manager. Tony was like, hey, let's do a record together. And so in the Cheesecake Factory in <laughs> Woodland Hills, California, there was myself, Rob, and Tony Iommi sitting here talking about creating a new thing. We were like, yes, let's let's do this. This like this is going to be amazing, right? So we all said yes, and then literally a week or two after that, Sharon Osborne reaches out to Tony and we was like, let's put this back together cuz we can make an absolute shit ton of money. And so the whole Halford thing went away and the beginning of the whole reunion of Black Sabbath came about, right? Sure. And I, you know, I was initially bummed, but then Rob and I and John Five started making the uh, Voyeurs record, right? And that to me was like 
at that point, probably in my career, that would have been maybe my favorite record that I had ever done. The, there was only one rub on that record was that I, I thought the best thing that we could do on that record was get this thing signed, make this record, get it signed to Interscope slash Trent Reznor's label. Because I thought that was the kind of cred that we needed to stamp this thing with to let everybody know this is the real deal. This is a cool ass record. Trent's on board, Interscope's on board, bada bing, bada boom. So the only rub on this is that I finished the record and it's like, let's put it like this. I had Tom Murillo come in and listen to the mix and he like turned to me afterwards and like, that is just the most amazing thing I've heard in you. And he actually, that was on his top 10 records of the 90s, right? But, wow. well, here's the rub though. It was pre-Trent Reznor because after I turned the record in, Trent, calls me up and it's like, Bob, electronica. It was like, and from the graduates, plastics. I just got one thing to say to you and that's plastics, right? And he was like, electronica. And I'm like, yes, what does that mean? You know? So Trent remixed the record, but really took all of the nutsack out of it and all of a sudden there was all this poopy, poop, 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 you know, right. electronica kind of stuff. And everything was like, you know, I was so bummed because it was like, it was the coolest, most badass record. Cause it was like John Five, just like in his in his real heyday and everything. And then sort of a lot of the guitars came out and electronica stuff came in. And it was, wow. a, you know, but here here's the takeaway though. At the end of the day, it didn't really matter because audiences were like, fuck you, where's Rob Halford? Where's mm. breaking the law, breaking the law? Where's that? They rebelled against that record so hardcore because they just didn't want him to change. And that's that's a really interesting point, because I feel like there's a couple of records you have done with artists who have been at that point in their career where they've wanted to try something different or they've, they've wanted to try and, and move with the times. That being one of the albums that you just mentioned then. But also you think about Alice Cooper's Brutal Planet yeah. album from 2000, which is at that point, what, it's 11 years since Trash, that huge, the huge album. I think it had been six years since The Last Temptation. So quite a lot of time since he'd put out a studio record at which point the music scene has changed completely. So he comes to you wanting to, I guess, make a record that keeps him relevant. How do you, I mean, what's your job as a, as a producer in that, in those situations? How do you, how do you help them? And, and how do you see these artists, I guess, struggle with that, that need to, to change? Well, the reality is, is that artistically, you have to grow, you have to change. And in the case of Alice Cooper, my buddy Bob Ezrin was the one that came to me and he's like, hey, man, we need you to kind of make a, a Alice Cooper record that's relative today, you know, mm. and we had the whole conversation. I mean, we sat there and with Alice and Bob and we just went through. It's like, hey, man, we got to make something that's newer and bold, you know, and we did. And, you know, it's like, I hate to say this because this is this is not a negative against any of those artists. But the truth is, is that it probably wasn't going to be successful, whatever it was, because the day in the sun had sort of come and gone. You know, you can, in a lot of respects, it doesn't really matter because an audience is like, Hey man, play the old stuff. You know when mm. that when your fa you go to see your favorite band twenty five years later, and they're playing their new record, and you're going like, what? What the fuck are you doing? I don't want to hear that. You know, it's like one of my favorite bands when I was a kid was Yes, right? And I'm like, dude, I want to hear Close to the Edge. I want to hear Fragile. Right. I don't want to hear some. Nee, 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 nee. It's like, dude, what are you doing, right? So, <laughs> it, in in some respects. It's just, you know, my job ultimately is to 
try to honor both the artist, you know, the artist and the band, but also my job is also to say, okay, here's what the artist wants and here's what the audience wants. How do we figure out how to get those together? You know, because uh, you, know, I a lot of times I'll guest speak at you know universities and music schools and stuff, and you know kids will ask me, it's like, well, how can you go from Tracy Chapman and Cheryl Crow and Wilson Phillips and th- to Black Sabbath and Marilyn Manson and Rob Zombie? It's like how you know, and I said because it's all music. It's all just understanding. Here's the artist. Here's the audience. How do you get them to connect? You know, so they're both speaking the same language because there's a lot of times where the artist is saying, well, I speak French and you guys speak Swahili. You know, it's like Mm -hmm. it doesn't, you know, it doesn't connect. Right. So that, you know, that's part of my responsibility. Listen, in some respects, if I think the artist is like jumping off the cliff, not in the good way and. I'll let them know. I'll say, hey, you know what? That, you know, nobody's going to nobody's going to connect to that. I'll I'll say something if I believe it, but but in the case of both Rob and Alice Cooper is that they needed something new because mm. they were just simply going to flatline if they didn't try something new, right? And in a lot of ways, it, it, I'm starting to get this, you know, thing where I see and, you know, with fans and stuff, they're finally going, oh, yeah, man, I finally listened to the Voyeurs record. That's pretty fucking cool, you know. And the right. same with Brutal Planet. I'm starting to see, you know, because I see the uptick where, like, people that didn't even give it their, it all was because they were so angry, they didn't want their iconic hero to change. They didn't want to give it a shot. And now I'm starting to see them evolve and grow and say, okay, hey, you know what? Ah, that's actually way cooler than I thought it was, you know? <laughs> I was going to say, Alice plays Brutal Planet now, yeah. live, and yeah. it always goes down a treat. Yeah. No, I know. That's that's why that's what I mean. It's like, you know, bottom line is he loved that record. And he, you know, he was happy with it and thrilled. So it, it is what it is, you know? Yeah. And as I've always said, it's like, hey, man, I, you know, I don't know how many records that I've made, but I've made a shit ton and not all of them are winners. You know, I've made a few, you know, like, whoa, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. So I've I've had a few, you know, a few uh, a few big misses. So. Well, you've had you've had a lot of big hits as well. And oh, I just wanted- I, yeah, I'm I'm blessed because I've had way more you know, big, big records than not. So it's right. it's sort of been, you know, it's at this point, it's way more in my favor than against. So <laughs> how much as a, as a producer, how much do you feel the pressure of expectation? And again, I'm thinking about the reunion album, the Sabbath album. So it was a live album, but it also had two new tracks on the end, um, Psycho Man and Selling My Soul, which I think were the first tracks that Sabbath had done with Ozzy since what? Never Say Die in 1978. So there's a lot of expectation, like from fans, from critics. As the producer, are you conscious of that in the studio? Are you thinking, God, these have got to be good? Well, yeah, yeah, you you always want it to be good. But, you know, in that case, I'm somewhat at the mercy, you know. And not everything was my call, if you will. There are outside voices? Yeah, there's always outside voices. The difference is at, you know, the 30-something-year-old producer versus the 65-year-old producer today. (laughs) At this point, it's like, it's way easier for me to say, you know, shut the hell up. One of us in this room has sold millions and millions of records and others haven't. So, you know... (laughs) I mean, you don't want to pull that card because that's kind of douchey. You know, it's kind right. of a, a douchey thing to say. But but there's some times where you just got to say, hey, man, you know, it's like, shut up, you know. But I've, I've always said it, it's really important for me as a producer. I want to listen to everybody's voice because you never know 
like, oh my God, that's the coolest idea ever, you know? And if that idea makes this record better, then absolutely. I don't care, you know, I don't care how we get there just so long as we do, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, you know, the, <laughs> the motto. But it's hard because that reunion record I had difficulty with. And I've, I've never been one to, to blame anything because ultimately it's always my responsibility. No matter what, it, what happens, it's always my responsibility. So I, I can only, you know, I have to take the blame for everything, you know, and it's really tough because it just, it is what it is. So there you go. <laughs> but it is hard when, when your name is is on as producer because people the average fan goes well that was like he did everything like that was his it was all his call yeah but the truth is it isn't it is but it's not <laughs> and <laughs> you gotta t take one for the team i mean that's kind of how it works and uh you can't blame the artist and i gotta be honest i absolutely love tony and ozzy so much i just love those guys i had the best time I ended up doing two more records with Tony and I, you know, and Ozzy. And so to me, it was like, hey, you know what? It's tough because like, for instance, the whole thing started because I was actually working with Tony on his Iomi record. Mm. They were mixing the reunion record, the, the live part of it. And mm. it just was awful. I mean, it just, it was recorded so badly and, you know, things like they forgot to put audience mics up. So there was no audience whatsoever. Wow. So they're like, at the end of the song, it was like cricket, cricket, you know, it's like, <laughs> and Tony is listening to the, the playback of this in the other studio and going, this is embarrassing. We can't do this. So Tony and everybody, they asked me if I would mix the live record. And I'm like, sure. And so I just sort of pulled everything up and uh, pulled it apart and sort of figured out how to resurrect this thing. And But I, I love the fact that all of the audience you hear on that is like samples from football stadiums and, you know, and just like all sorts of different stadiums and small venues and large, and just, and I just sat there and I blended it together. And then I would do the, wow, you know, and the, the whole bit, it was like, it ended up being the best that it was going to be, you know, right. and as far as the studio stuff there, you know, it was tough because, you know, this was right before Bill's heart attack. You know, and Bill was really having a tough time. And the the very first day that we were actually where we were going to literally write and come up with the the um, studio tracks, we come in the first day and there's, it. you know, we're in uh, the mix room in Henson. So because I just wanted a small environment. Right. And I come walking in and there's like 30 people in this room. And I'm like, what in the hell is going on, right? And it's because there's assistants and assistants, assistants, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, no, this is got. So I was like, everybody who's not in Sabbath, get the fuck out of here, right? <laughs> so I kicked everybody out. And, it, and then it was just literally Tony, Ozzy, Bill, and Geezer and myself. And we're sitting there and it was at the first, it was like this sort of weird, awkward silence, right? And there was, you know, and then all of a sudden, Ozzy's kind of leans over to, to Tony and goes, hey, you remember that time you set Bill on fire? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh my God. And then we proceeded for like, and I'm not kidding, it was like two solid hours of the most <laughs> insane hysterical stories of them almost dying and like just the mayhem, the mayhem of the old days on tour. Right. And it was just the most amazing thing. And then that just sort of, you know, set the whole thing up. But, you know, the reality was, is that it, 
it it was what it was and it was going to be what it was and you know shit happens what are you gonna mm. do you know so what a privilege though to be able to sit in that environment just with the four members of black sabbath and have them trade stories like that oh trust me it's like and, and just the the like oh one of my other phase i i tell this one all the time because it's so funny so Ozzy, I could always tell within seconds whether that it was going to be a work day or not, because Ozzy would like come in and he, oh, Bob, Bob, I, I need a nap. I, I, I can't. I've got to go to the bathroom or like, you know, it's like or he'd come in. It's like, come on, Bob, let's go. Right. And actually, that became the joke for the whole record is, come on, Bob. <laughs> and it's like, and that was that was going to be a work day. Right. And and but the other days were like, yep, that's it. Not going to do anything today. So. Right. So Ozzy comes in. He's like, you know, OK, come on, Bob. This is going to be a good work day. i got to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. <laughs> so Henson Studios is a horseshoe complex. Right. So. Like you come in on this side, you go around. We're the farthest back inside studio. The bathrooms were around the horseshoe in the front up there, right? So Ozzy goes to the bathroom. He goes up here, goes to the bathroom. And then when he comes back, instead of coming to the inside, he goes to Studio D (laughs) and he goes in and sits down, right? But we didn't know that. And like, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes go by. And I'm like, and so I'm like, where the fuck is Ozzy? What's going on? What is he doing? Right. So I sent my assistant. I said, OK, listen, go find out where Ozzy is. Did he leave the building? And all of a sudden his handlers are freaking out because like, oh, my God, Ozzy's missing. Right. And so. Everybody's going crazy. Couldn't, you know, a half hour goes by, right? And this, you got to understand, it's not unusual for Ozzy just to sit down for a half hour, reading the newspaper, just hanging out, doing nothing, right? So my assistant gets a call from the assistant in the uh, Studio D going, hey, you know, Ozzy's over in our room, right? And my guy comes in and tells me, and he's like, hey, Ozzy's in studio. I'm like, well, go get his ass out of Studio D. Who's who's even over there, right? So he goes over. And this is the best part. He goes over and he goes like, um, Ozzy, yeah, we're actually in mixed room. We're over there. And he, like, puts his paper down. He looks around. He goes, oh, yeah. I thought I didn't recognize anybody. Oh, then he looks around at the band in there and he goes, all right, boys, see you later. And he gets up, walks over to our room. But the greatest thing was the band and everybody in that room were so psyched that Ozzy wanted to come over and hang out with them and listen to what they were doing. And no one had the heart to tell him that. Yeah, he was just lost. <laughs> he didn't know where <laughs> he was. Do you know who going. that band yeah. was? Yeah, and he was just lost. And he finally comes back to their room, and it's like, all right, Bob, let's go. <laughs> and I'm like, Dude. Like, yeah. There, there's some... Do you know who that band was in, in the other room? I don't even, I don't even remember who it was. It was, sorry. Right. It's like, That's okay. But I just, I just love the sort of, you know, because Ozzy just was this wonderful sort of oblivious naive six-year-old, you know? The the greatest thing about Ozzy is that he's so much nicer and funnier than you would think. Mm -hmm. He really is a funny, cool, sharp guy, you know? That's not to say there's days when he's just like, he doesn't want to be there and he's, you know, it's like he's like over the whole thing. And he just wants to go home and watch the History Channel, you know? Right. But I, I, actually, I'll, I'll um, tell you another one. Probably one of my more iconic moments was um, this was on Iomi's record, the Iomi album. And I'm sitting there and it's it's the Dave Grohl song that we we had done. Um, I forget the name of the song, but. So I'm I'm here at the console and I'm just sort of listening here. We have Dave Grohl out there. We have he's playing drums on it, and and we had you know I forget the uh, bass player from um, Soundgarden was playing, oh, and Ben Shepard. Right here, I had Brian May. Wow. And right here, I had Tony Iommi, 
And out there, I had Dave Grohl. Wow. And, I, and I'm like sitting here going, don't they know I'm just a dude from Lincoln, Nebraska? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, because you, you got to remember, it's like, you know, the whole success and, you know, it's like you don't in your life when you're living it, you're not third person looking at it going, I'm a legend. I'm, a, you know, it's like, I've done all these, right? That's not how you think because you're in the middle of living it. You're just making music and just that. But, you know, to have Brian May sort of leaning down, Bob, what would you like me to play? And I'm like, right, fuck, this is like insane. <laughs> this is so cool, you know. How do you do that? How do you do that then? How do you step out of the, the fan thinking, oh, I'm just a kid from Lincoln, Nebraska, and actually work as a producer and say, well, Brian, I need you to do this, this, and this. Well, it's because you got to remember at, at the end of the day, you're like, you got to snap out of it and go, oh yeah, I'm doing my job, you know? And, and it's like, it, it, the, the analogy I use a lot of time is like, um, I don't fly anymore, but I used to be a private pilot. I got my pilot's license and I flew and everything. It's like when you're flying, you don't stop and think, oh my God, I'm flying a plane. <laughs> it's like, or, <laughs> you know, it's like you, you just sort of, you kick in and you do what it is that you're trained to do. Okay, yeah. where, in what process, oh, I need this on, I need landing light, I need, you know, bump. You're just doing the stuff you do, right? And at the end of the day, you know, I usually allow myself a moment to take in the coolness of it. But then it's like, oh yeah, this is my job. And there's a reason why I'm here. And it's because I'm really good at what I do. And I, you know, I know I'm, I've always said making records, I'm always the guy who always has another idea. You know, when they, when the whole room is like, I don't know, what are we going to do here? I'm like, Hey, why don't we try this? You know? And it's because I've had a lifetime you know, remember, I've been making, you know, I made my first record in locally in Nebraska in 1972. Wow. Okay. I've been, <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. Right. So that sort of aspect kicks in. And, you know, it's funny because I had this conversation with a, a buddy of mine, David Kahn, and he was producing Paul McCartney. And at that time I was actually producing um, Alice Cooper. I was in Studio B and he was in Studio A and we would hang out. We'd get together and go over, you know, ideas and just, you know, chit chat and stuff. And, he, you know, we were talking, um, he had just gotten the McCartney gig, right? And I'm like, dude, that's insane. You're going to produce Paul McCartney, right? You know, and we got to talk, talking about sort of, process and technique and things like that. And, and, you know, I said, one of the things to him, I said, listen, I mean, to, in my thought process, really it's in, in some ways it's about, you know, presenting yourself as the yin to his yang, because when you think about all the greatest stuff he's ever done, there's always a yin to his yang whether it's, you know, John Lennon or whoever, you know, and it's good. There's always been a yin and yang that's balanced mm -hmm. out. So he didn't get too sappy poppy when he was sort of left alone. A lot of times it would be a little, yeah, little you know, so that's, you know, I said, Hey, you know, that's what I would do is I would just be the juxtaposition to his, you know, his thing. And, you know, we were talking and he was like, Oh yeah, that's cool. And so, um, couple of weeks later, you know, we, we see each other in the hallway, right? And I go, how's that going? He said, well, it's a little bit like this, right? We, you know, we were doing vocals and I'm listening to the vocals, realizing how hard it is to produce Paul McCartney, because every time you hear his voice, you're going, oh my God, that's Paul McCartney, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And, but really the end takeaway at the end of the day, he, you know, you would say, hey, Paul, yeah, that was really good. Could we maybe try one more? It's like, and Paul was like, 
no, I think is really great just the way it is. And you're like, right. well, there you go. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's so great. So, but that, that leads me to uh, my Paul McCartney encounter, right? So um, Paul McCartney, I'm in Studio B uh, producing Alice Cooper. I'm buried in, working on a mix. I'm buried in the console. I hear a knock on the door, right? And I'm, I didn't even look up. I'm, come on in, come on in, right? And all of a sudden, I hear that voice. And it's like, <laughs> oh, my. And he's like, is Alice around? And I'm like, oh, oh, my God, right? And that was probably of all of my career and everybody that I've worked with, and I worked with a shit ton, that was the only time I was literally, oh, fuck, that's, <laughs> that's the, everything. That is the sum total of the universe right here talking to me, right? <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, it's like, in that split second, I was like, okay, breathe, okay? <laughs> Don't say anything stupid. You know, it's like going through a checklist of like, you know, a quick checklist of, oh, yeah. It's like, so he um, he he starts chit-chatting and I'm like, and all I'm thinking of like, oh, my God, I'm chit-chatting with Paul McCartney. <laughs> and he is the nicest, coolest dude ever. I mean, like he's insanely nice and cool. And we just started talking and, and and I had so many sort of epiphanies from that. And, and, you know, one of the things was I realized that how important it was for him to put people at ease right from the get go. And it's primarily because he would never have a normal conversation with another human being if he didn't make that effort to put you immediately at ease and realize he is just a cool, nice dude who wants to hang and have a chat. You know, mm -hmm. the other thing was that in his mind, he's talking to the producer of Alice Cooper. Right. So it's like, I'm like, but it's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's like you know, <laughs> the insecurity is like, yeah, but it's me, you know, it's like, yeah. And, and so and, and I found out some interesting things. Number one, he he used to be really good friends with Alice Cooper. They were buds right. and they yeah. would hang out, you know, like he was telling me stories how, you know, him and his wife, Linda, would, you know, go out with to dinner with Alice and his wife. Right. The other thing, there was a couple of things that were amazing. One, he <clears throat> was already married to. The um, another uh, his I think it was Heather or whatever he was married to her, mm -hmm. but he still referred to Linda as his wife, and that was really interesting. I thought that was mm -hmm. cool because you could really tell that you know she was truly the love of his life, you know, and that was that was really cool. Um, yeah, this th this what I'm about to say was probably the single biggest real epiphany for me because I I remember this same sort of thought process with uh, with David Lee Roth, right? Because the Beatles, their number ones record had just gone number one again, right? So he added another number one. I'm like, oh, dude, congratulations on another number one. And he mm -hmm. goes, oh, thanks. You know, man, that's really cool. And he, go, and he goes, and, and he was dead, dead honest okay. and clear about it. He said, you know, what's really interesting is... I hadn't listened to that stuff in years. It's like, we actually wrote some pretty cool songs back then. The music that changed the world and our lives and everything to him was like, oh yeah, man, we did some pretty cool stuff back then. Cause to, wow. but here's the takeaway. Here's the real takeaway. And I've, I've, you know, applied this in multiple scenarios is that Got to remember something, just as I was saying about, you know, when you're in your own skin, you're not sort of looking at yourself in that third person kind of sense, right? And to him, that was just his band when he was a kid. Right. That was just, his band was the Beatles. 
but they were all friends and they lived the Beatles. So it wasn't this like, oh my God, you know, I'm sure he understands the weight of the Beatles, but when he's just sitting there chit-chatting with me, to him, it's just like, oh yeah, that was my band when I was a kid. And I remember relating it to David Lee Roth because Dave and I were having kind of the same conversation because this was right when the, um, remember the first Van Halen reunion where it kind of blew up and got weird, right? And, you know, he was bitching because he was like, hey, man, you know, why don't we set up like the old days where we set up in a circle and we all play together towards each other and and Eddie was like, yeah, that's not really how we do it. We have in-ears and we do it <laughs> this this way. And he was like, he was like, fuck, man, what? You know, it's like, and then I was sort of applying that principle in the sense of going, well, yeah, because you got to remember that was David Lee's band when he was a kid with his friends and yeah. how much they sort of ended up bugging each other and sort of being pissed and all that kind of dysfunction and stuff. And that's the thing, because we look at it like Van Halen or the Beatles or this, yeah. but and and Black Sabbath, you know, because uh, Ozzy told me the whole story of how Sabbath first got together, right, with mm. at the um, music store, there was one of those papers with the pulling off the stub of a phone number, right? You know, for lead singer, right? And he didn't know who it was. He just pulled it off and, all right, well, let's go over and meet the, you know. And they opened the door and Ozzy's like, oh, fuck, it's you, right? (laughs) Because he knew him from school and I guess used to beat him up in school or whatever, right? And it was like, so that was the beginning of Sabbath was that like, all right, well, I guess, you know, because... Ozzy's, you know, his parents bought him a PA, so yeah. he had the PA. So it was like, all right, I guess you're in the band because you got a PA. So, <laughs> and and you know, people don't realize the first name of Sabbath was actually Earth. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, <laughs> so, and so it's, funny. it's funny what you're saying because I always wonder whether when bands get to a certain point, Guns and Roses, for example, being a good example, when there's so much around them there's so many people around them it's a huge business there's huge crowds when they're just in a recording studio together can they just be that band can they just be well however many musicians are in there now but can axel slash and duff just go back to that time in their heads where they were just kids playing music some can some can't i mean that that's the reality is some some people are just understand it and are wired to say, yeah, okay, cool, man. Now it's just us. Let's just go make music. Let's go make this happen. And, you know, some people just drink the Kool-Aid. Listen, when some people, no matter what I say, if you've drank the Kool-Aid, you know, because trust me, I've seen enough things sort of come and go to realize how tough it is when you, you know, when you drink the Kool-Aid and you actually believe the shit, you know, Mm. and because it's, it's always the same thing. It's like, you, and, and I don't mean this in a negative sense at all, but you'd be surprised at how many artists and bands and musicians are just simply one trick ponies. They do a certain thing and they're so lucky that that certain thing millions of people like. Mm. And you'd be surprised how many musicians and and artists struggle with that in knowing the fact that they're limited or whatever sort of way you want to look at it, you know, but it's, you know, and that's part of the psyche that, you know, um, you got to remember it there, you know, it's like a producer job is, is like 80% therapist, you know, (laughs) it's like, and I spent a lot of time when I was young on the therapy couch too. So that helped me immensely in understanding artists and understanding the, the fragile psyche of, (laughs) of musicians, you know? And, and one of the simplest things is it's shocking how many bands and artists don't understand this. There's, there's this thing where, you know, 
one musician is talking to another musician in a band. And the one musician is saying, hey, man, can we try a, a slightly different pre-chorus? Because I think maybe we could get, you know, a little bit more build to you know, really launch the chorus. And the other musician heard, you fucking piece of shit. I hate everything you do. You suck. You'd be shocked <laughs> at how many people don't actually, they're, they're not making the, the connection yeah. because the wires get crossed and they're not hearing each other. And I've done a lot of therapy sessions with bands where we've sat and had that very conversation of understand what it is that's really going on here. So mm. that's a big part of the job, you know? And, and the teaching, that's the other big thing for me is that every artist that I work with, I'm really all about helping to teach. More, I, I've had so many artists come back to me, you know, years later, decades later and go, hey, man, you changed my life. You know, you changed my musical life. And I'm like, you know, that to me is like probably one of the single most rewarding things, you know, because the money, you, you just spend the money. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm going to Italy again. You know, you just like, <laughs> the, yeah, the, mo the money's gone. You know, you spend the money, so be it. But it's that thing, you know, I always said that that was the thing when they, you know, finally put me in the dirt, you know, mm. it's like, I just want a bunch of people around going, thanks, man. You know? Yeah. Nice. Uh, Bob, just to finish up, Jackster is all about giving credit where credit is due. Are there people that you would give credit to for, for helping you get where you are today? Every single person I ever worked with in my life. I, I've always said that, like, none of, we don't live in a vacuum. It's not like, you know, it's like, oh, I'm here because I'm so, you know, it's like everything leads you from here to there, you know, and you'd be surprised it's, you know, it's, and it's not always the, you know, it's not always the people you think, you know, it's like some people it's like, oh, the, the rock stars help you get there. No, that's, it's just every single person, every assistant that I've ever had in my life. They're the ones that, you know, it's like they, you know, it's like when I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the console going, uh, how come this doesn't work? I'm like pushing this up and then nothing works. It's mm -hmm. all of those people, you know, every assistant on every record that's, you know, every tech guy, maintenance guy, everybody. It takes a village to make a record. You know, right. you don't make it in a vacuum, you know, and it's like it, and even, you know, all the, like studio managers and people that, help negotiate and get me a, a a price that works to do the record so I can record it at that studio, you know? And the other thing, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but uh, in 2000, I think it was 2001, um, Island Def Jam gave me um, my own label. So I had Halo Records started in 2001. And I learned so much from that because being on the other side of the fence, what a shocker to realize what A&R guys and record execs have to go through to, to make stuff happen and the pressure. And, you know, it's like, which was so wonderful because it was such an eye opening experience for me to really be on the inside of how things actually went down. And that mm. was so great in helping bands understand. It's like, it is not you against the label. You are partners in this. Without them, you don't get to do what you do. And without you, they don't get to do what they do. So figure out how to work together and be partners in this, you know? It's teaching bands that like, hey, listen, when you're making that record and you're bitching because the label wants one more single, you know, it's like, hey, if you just understand that every record made, with the exception of less than a handful of records, 
do you ever have more than four singles? So if you say, and I just teach bands, it's like, hey, 40% of your record is for the world. 60% of the record can be all about you. Whatever you want to do, it's totally cool. So long as you give them 40% of the record and make it stick. And one song, one song can change your life forever, forever. Mm. One song can really make the difference in how your life turns out. Bob, thank you so much for your time. It's been so great to chat to you. My pleasure. And you are the man, man. It's like, seriously, it's been it's been very enjoyable. Because, listen, doing it, even, you know, going back to what I was saying, even things like this, I'm at the mercy of you, you know, and it's like, if you know, it's like it's that's what it's all about, man. It's everybody making shit happen. So, yeah, well, it's so great. It, I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure, my friend. My pleasure. And that's it for another episode of Humans of Music. A big thanks to Bob for his time and thank you for listening. If you have any feedback on the show or suggestions on who you'd like me to interview, or even if you just want to say hello, please drop me a line at humansofmusic at jaxta.com. That's humans of music, one word, at jaxta, J-A-X-S-T-A dot com. This episode was mixed by Lachlan Mitchell from Parliament Studios in Annandale, and the incidental music and theme song were written and performed by Sam Lockwood. Please remember to subscribe to the Humans of Music podcast so you never miss an episode, or even better, share it amongst your friends and rate and review it. And remember, next time you need to know who wrote a song, who produced a song, who engineered it, who played on it, who sang on it, who did anything on it, head to jackster.com for all your official music credit information. Until the next episode of Humans of Music, I'm Rod Yates. Thanks for listening.